Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Casper. Hello. Hey, Christian. Nice to see you. Nice Thanks to see you as me. well. And, and for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? My name is Casper Larsen, and I'm a senior solution architect out of uh, Denmark. I've worked for a company called Philipmind, and I became an MVP here in January this year. Uh, at the mature age of uh, 54, so I'm not exactly one of the young guys, but it's nice to 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 be able to contribute to the community as well, even though uh, I'm not the youngest anymore. Um, I am uh, doing a lot of uh, community work as well, and I am primarily working on the PMP modern search because well, search has been sort of like the fulcrum of my of my professional life for the last well. I, I started working with SharePoint back in 2010, I think. Wow. And that was a painful experience. Um, so what? it's just been, what? It, it's matured a lot. <laughs> and, and yeah. If people think that the old days were better, I tend to disagree because, yeah. well, uh, moving oh. to the cloud solved a lot of problems because I'm not really into infrastructure. I prefer just have the solution and helping people. So that was a nice move for, that was a, absolutely a nice move. You, sure. you know, so I had my first meeting at Microsoft back in 2004, talking with some members of the SharePoint product team that wanted me to stop by and wanted to show me some of what they were working on. And my response to them was, this is garbage. Like, what, are you <laughs> kidding me? And so I showed them what I had was working on with a startup down in California and um, like high-end collaboration technology. But the difference was talking about the business aspect of it, they were trying to build something that was available, like anybody could go and use versus my the software that I was working on was like a million dollar entry point. So oh, yeah. the biggest of companies were using this. Yeah, well, that, that's sort of like, that's something that I've seen as well with Microsoft as well, that sometimes they tend to push a product for everybody which means that us as consultants, we sometimes have trouble keeping up because, well, some of the capabilities there, they are there for end users, but they are not necessarily there for us as consultants so because they don't have the API and so on and so forth. Right. But yeah, you get, you get used to it sometimes that uh, they just, uh, we have to wait a few years for, in order to, to get those of capabilities uh, where people can actually see it, but we can't provide it there programmatically. So, yeah. What to ask? So, like, when you go and you talk with prospect clients, do you talk about? Um, uh, well, no. Let me ask this: When you talk about uh, search, is the most common thing you're hearing now is like, well, why don't you just put Copilot on that? Not really, no, not oh. so far. Uh, because people, uh, the most of the people I tend to work with have realized that they have an issue that um, if they search for something like payroll they will actually see a file containing payroll information or that's really not the, so, so they realize they have to get their house in order before they release any kind of copilot on, on their tenant. Uh, so, so that's, I'm usually there as second role basically, because the first role is that, well, we have to get copilot in order as soon as possible because that's a great advantage. And then they realize just like, can I say the word delve? Yeah. Just like back in the right. day when Delft was released, people realized that it can it can see all kind of stuff, which they didn't realize that it was actually available. So we see the same kind of tendencies nowadays that people are very enthusiastic initially, and then they realize, oh, we have to clean up before we actually release uh, any kind of co-pilots. And I think it will get better now that we can get co-pilots for individual sites or lists or libraries. Right. That well, also we have this. Um, RSS restricted SharePoint search, where we can just say this site, this site, and this site is what you have to use for grounding in, on your copilot. That that makes sure that we have a good idea about our, our grounding and not just releasing it on, on on anything on our tenants. So yeah. Well, that's that's always. I mean, when I would see premium search solutions, it's where they had focused 
you know, solution sets. So you might have SharePoint environment, everybody's in there collaborating to all these things out there. But if you were going to go and search, like they, they actually had like a company. So a client, former client had a, uh, they would put archive all projects once completed over in this other location, which automatically picked up the search and all the assets. So when you were going and doing lightweight search for something you're actively working on, it didn't work that well. But if you were going and looking through the archives, like it was a solid search experience and refiners and like, it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but they, again, it was closely managed. Yeah, we also often see that when we have a sort of specific workload, like we have contracts, that's a classic one. We have yeah, exactly that all of the content is very well organized. We have exact knowledge about which is uh, valid, which is not valid, when is it going to expire, and so on and so forth. That's where uh, solutions like PMP Modern Search really shines because it's just, it's not just a broad, basically, pile of whatever. Uh, it's always a uh, well, well tendered uh, material. So, so that's where we. We, we yeah. focus our effort at least. So, yeah. What's funny? So, I mean, a lot of my life is around governance. I mean, I like, so I yeah, was doing, exactly. you know, internet governance back in the late 90s and started building project management organizations. And a lot of it was, you know, the governing body for IT and for services teams. Um, and had many clients as a consultant, you know, back in the early 2000s around that. Um, and it, it's, I find myself talking about the same themes like you said it's it's, oh, yes. it's like you can't rely on security through obscurity like you have to have intent you have to go and build and it and it's and, and there's as much as you can structure your information architecture and and you can put policies in place and guardrails for users around that you will never get away that there still needs to be a like a community management aspect to that it, there yeah. you're it's work for life you know, basically, yeah, when you, you, you can set up the guardrails so that they it will take like 90% of the issues that you might that might pop up, but you're still, yeah, you still have to have somebody who has that specific knowledge of what is this actually supposed to be or where it's supposed to uh, because you'll always get exceptions, that's, right? So that's that's well, the, the rule is that you get exceptions basically. Right. So yeah. when you start to see trends in the exceptions, that's where you automate that and fix that and move on to the next. I mean, Excellent. that's, yeah. that's a, well, again, change management is a big part of the discussion. It's like, look, the business is constantly changing users, appetites, their knowledge, mm -hmm. their, their abilities are changing. Obviously the technology is rapidly changing around that. All those yeah. things tweak. And so is the company because, well, I, I, I really like that maturity model that is, is often used where we go from level 100, where it's all ad hoc and we do whatever we please to level 500, where everything is, uh, uh, rainbows and sunshine, uh, but the, some, somewhere in between that we have to take this company, their maturity level is just not there initially, but it will have to improve over time. Otherwise, the, it will just collapse, I guess. Uh, same we have seen. I don't know if you have worked with um, SharePoint storage. The amounts of data that is put into our tenants is const constantly growing, and, and a lot yeah. of companies now are actually hitting the ceiling where they have to pay for additional storage to Microsoft and that's when they start uh, getting creative of how they can actually minimize their storage consumption. So, so that's isn't also it, an, a, a, also a kind of governance, but that's also yeah. an, an area where I work a lot. Really. Isn't it kind of funny? Like where I started my career in uh, working in data warehousing, a lot of my uh, my experience was we were trying to um, there's you know so much data, but the cost was so high of the storage accessing that getting performing you know, anal you know, analytics out of that. Um, so mm -hmm. I remember back in 95, 96, working with business objects, DSS strategy, a bunch of these, and going in and going after a data mart strategy where if you wanted to go ask these sorts of questions from one group, then we build a mart for that department, for that yeah. business unit. The, another that would take slice and dice differently, the data, most of the same data. Like I, anyway, a, a lot of those projects where you had to be very efficient and because of the cost was so high, how you'd structure and what kinds of queries, that, you know, how you were using that data. So we would go and build reports and then build more and more complex reporting that allowed users to go in and, and then they'd ask, it, well, we want to look at the data in this way. It's not just a matter of reconfiguring a spreadsheet. We'd have to go back to the data 
restructure, align this stuff, join and unjoin things and do another, pull down another subset to do the reporting against it because the massive amounts of data, all of that now <laughs> where yeah. again, there's so much data. It's in some respects, it's the same problem, but different that we're going through now. We don't have the storage costs like it was then, but there's so much and so much complexity and the just the electricity to run the you know, <laughs> yeah. AI and the tools and things around it. But um, it, so it's a different, if it's a different cost. Yeah, it's a and different it's also, way of it's looking It's actually at. a cultural thing as well. Now, I yeah. don't know if you're ever familiar with that, but as far as I can see with the American customers I have, uh, we can see that they have a tendency to, 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 to try to get rid of, of stuff when it's expired, we delete it. In Europe, we don't delete anything ever. It's just, yeah. uh, it's, it's, we will keep it forever because one day we might need it. It's the same as what, what you do with your electrical cables. Well, I have, have to put it in a box somewhere because we might use it someday. Well, I'd say it's, depending on the role, depending on like, like so I, so my, before I got into tech, my first job, salary job was working for a law firm. Part of my job was managing the long-term storage. There were five, seven and 10 year documents that, on that date, like within seven days after that date, they had to be destroyed. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was a legal issue. Like they had to be professionally destroyed yeah. um, so that there was like, they're, they're, that they're gone. Um, I know with a lot of other content, you're right. Uh, you know, organizations that like we, uh, stuff that we don't need, um, we, but we don't know. I think that's a, the price, the cost of storage dropped so rapidly, so dramatically that organizations started saving everything and then was still with no understanding of what they would use long-term. Mm -hmm. And your point is that they're now saying, well, we've never used it. We've been carrying, like, let's just get rid of this. Why are we paying for this? Still not fully understanding. So again, it goes back to what we talked about with search. You hey, need to understand what you have. Yeah. yeah and you, can, you, can't, you can't, if you take some piece of information, well, who's actually the owner of this if you don't know who's the owner of, of this particular kind of information it's it's a kind of a daunting job to to decide whether you can just throw it out or we have to keep it so so just to err on the side of of course we just keep everything because we right. don't have any idea who actually knows if this is pertinent or not so because that was bob and bob left 15 years ago so who knows <laughs> so yeah. yeah we'll never get rid of it well that that's why again i would say it, it, the as part of if you have a strong information architecture mm. we know and we're doing the properly you know uh classification and labeling of content coming in you're less likely to have those issues and we also as we see more and more companies now taking archiving seriously just not the one that we had back in the day where we we still have today where we can archive a site where we'll just make it read only right but now we also have like intelligent versioning where we'll actually strip that strip off some of the, off some of the file versions by using uh, AI, which is one of the um, SharePoint premium features. It's actually free. It's it's an offering from Microsoft that is free. That's something new. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, be it's, suspicious it's, of that. No. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there must be a catch somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but and also we have the like the Microsoft archiving where we can just put it in some kind of cheaper. Right. Uh, storage where it will cost, a fifth, I think it's uh, a fourth of, uh, of the right. cost yep. that we used to. And of course, we also have other windows that, that can provide something similar. They can put it in Azure uh, file share or whatever. There's some, however they prefer to do it. So I see a lot of people actually taking that seriously and building that into their governance plans now. So yeah, that, that's, a, that's a nice change. That's for sure. Well, Casper, I, I do want to ask you like about, I always like asking, especially newer MVPs, like, so what was your journey um, to becoming an MVP? I mean, how long were you aware of the program? Were you trying to get in versus not trying? Like what, what's your, your origin story there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I followed the trend that was pretty common back in the, in, in the earlier days because uh, knowledge is power. So uh, I just hoarded all my knowledge. All of it. I just have to gather as much as possible. But then I realized uh, that was back in 2016. I think we went from SharePoint to SharePoint Modern, and uh, I was working with Share with Search. And suddenly we didn't have any 
kind of capabilities anymore because Microsoft didn't provide any search web parts for Martin. So that was just like, what am I supposed to do then? So I looked around and found out that there was this thing called PMP Modern Search, mm -hmm. uh, which was just an open source offering. That's kind of suspicious. Microsoft was really not into open source at that time. I remember some guy who had a problem with that for sure. Um, but okay, that seems like a good idea. Then a I certain CEO, some... is that who you're talking about? Oh, <laughs> I, won't, I won't mention any names. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Well, I also found out that there was something called uh, PNP uh, PowerShell, mm -hmm. which would increase my capabilities and, and, and ease my burden quite a lot. So that was also very nice. So we're back in 2019 at the uh, ESPC in Prague, I think it was. Yeah, yep. I saw uh, Evan van Hoenen, which is the, the father of uh, the PNP PowerShell. Yep. I saw him on stage and he was telling about how we could actually contribute back to the community. That was sort of like, perhaps I should consider doing that. So and then one step took took the next and uh, well, nowadays I'm I'm running a BMP Modern Search uh, along with Michael Svensson. Yep. And uh, that is really fun. And also running a PMP Modern Search uh, office hours. So where every two weeks I have an hour set aside for people where they can contact me and will go through their issues, whatever it is, or, or regarding to basic search and also PMP modern search, of course. So, um, and I joined the PMP core team this uh, March. So mm -hmm. that was also a big step. And of course, got my uh, MVP uh, status in the, uh, and that was, that took some time because I was uh, nominated by Michael Svensson from Microsoft back in May, I think. But then they were changing the system that they were using for right. PMP promotion and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that took from May until January yeah. uh, for, for that process. And that was just like, once you know that you are in sort of like in the system and it takes, it feels like forever <laughs> just to yeah. be approved. Then I guess, well, you have the same when you have to go through renewal each year, that sort of, uh, well, yeah, come on, it... get a, get, get, let's, let's hear what, what they came up with. Yeah. No, that's pretty pretty common. I'm hearing more and more though for for folks out there. I talk about a lot. Um, you know what I love about talking to people about kind of their how they got into the MVP program is, you know, obviously there's similarities, but um, it, it uh, you know, like I did an interview a couple. Uh, I published a couple of weeks back uh, with a woman who um, has never presented in public. She's working towards that goal. Um, she doesn't have a blog. She's like, I should start one. <laughs> it's like, well, what are you doing? She's doing the community stuff, the PMP. Oh, yeah. She's um, contributing to the GitHub and doing that stuff just quietly in the background where somebody at Microsoft, you know, recognize what's going on. It's like, you need to be in this program. Like you're doing a tremendous amount for us. It's, and, and so there's a lot of ways to, to get involved. I just, Absolutely. I just love hearing those, those backgrounds. Are you doing a lot of speaking conferences, stuff, that kind of stuff now? I had my debut as a speaker this uh, in the uh, European Collaboration Summit in Wiesbaden for two weeks ago. Yeah, uh, that was uh, that's the first time I've ever tried to have a session in English in front of my peers, and that was really nerve wracking, but it yeah. just went so well. That's it great. Was, uh, I expected like thirty or forty people in the room or something like that because there was a room for one hundred and forty. It was close yeah. to 200 people there. So yeah. it was just hey, like, the event sold out. So, I mean, yeah, it yeah, was, it, it was packed. It was, that's great. It, I really enjoyed it. That was so fun. But then they get that's it took some nerve to, to, to do it. But now uh, I'm actually scheduled for a uh, ESPC in uh, Stockholm uh, in I'll, December. Along I'll with be there. I'll see well. you there. So, yeah. yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, that was really that was fun because uh, that was that was uh, something new. So. Well, that that's great. I, I'll look forward to seeing that. I think that's right. As of now, I think that's my only European um, trip is in December um, for that. But, uh, you know, oh, uh, do you ever come over for any events? Are you going to be over in the U.S. this year? Yeah, I, 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 I was a member. I became a member of the MVP community. It's so, so late. So I am automatically enrolled for next year as well. So uh, I'll be there again this uh, For the summit? March. Yeah, yeah exactly. for the summit. Well, yeah, the, otherwise uh, it's too expensive for, for my employer to pay, to pay for the FAA. Each, each yeah. time I have well, that, that's the one you definitely want to do. And what I would say, especially yeah. coming as far as you are, is spend a little extra time at both ends if you're able to. I yeah. know that there's usually, like, like I lived in Seattle for 12 years. So going to Microsoft campus is not, 
you know, it, like I go stay with my sister. It's good to see family, but I usually like fly in as late as possible, leave as quickly as possible. I got stuff yeah. to do, but I know that there's activities that's going on as part of the, the, if you're interested in becoming an MVP, I mean, they, there's a lot of just pure community stuff where they go on mm. hikes, they've done paintballing together. They, <laughs> they go out and of course there's meals, every, gatherings every night. It's just a fantastic opportunity. I always say to new MVPs, I, it is the number one perk of becoming an MVP is that community is that annual summit of getting together, meeting with Microsoft people and all of your peers from around the world. Uh, it, it, you can't replace that experience. No, it's a really, uh, it's a very good uh, network to have because they will also they'll bring opportunities, but they also give you opportunity to, pro, to, to, to provide for the community because now you know who you can actually sort of like uh, poke if, if there's something that that you need to have to 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 get to the community so that's uh, yep. that's a very nice uh, and I, I and the, the fun thing is that i haven't seen anybody yet who was unpleasant <laughs> that was sort of, if you have 3000 people there's always one who is uh, who is not uh, that nice but not in this group for some reason that's uh, that's, a, that's i a, i think that was uh, there's some an intentional cleanup that has happened, yeah. you know, but there are standards for MVPs as well. Yeah. And there have been people that have been removed that have abused that standard. So I, I so I appreciate that too, that Microsoft has been more mindful to mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not just about the technical capability. It's the people that no. really care about community. And so that's why I say is tell people, it's like, if, like, don't have a fear of going and talking to an MVP. Like we're the people more than anyone out there that loves connecting with people talking, sharing. That's why we became MVP. So reach out and have a conversation. Yeah, it's not just the most technical and uh, knowledgeable people. It's also those who are really pushing the, the, the message. So uh, right. yeah. Yep. Well, Casper, really appreciate your time getting to know you and uh, hopefully we'll see you uh, at the end of the year at that event. But in the meantime, people want to find you. Where are you most active at on social? Yeah, on Twitter. That would yeah. be Twitter and then on LinkedIn. And of course, on the GitHub repository for PMP Modern Search. So uh, those well, are the... the we'll have all the related, all the relevant links and stuff out there. So Casper, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. See you. Wow. Wow.